video off until it's okay yeah all right i think we're live uh, hello everyone uh, my name is jared burke with kif cure here coming to you from kif cure headquarters in maple park illinois i'm here joined with me to my right is ryan getzelman uh, as our director of uh, cultivation um, uh, also on the on the uh, webinar today with us i have uh, paul weibel who is our our VP of sales, and also I have uh, Michael Edinger, who is our director of labs and extractions. So thank you all for coming and uh, joining us today as we walk through some of these uh, vital things here in the upcoming 2020 grow season and beyond. Um, uh, we uh, will we'll go through here a little bit of the um, uh, presentation. Uh, well, uh, kind of just setting the agenda. Uh, Paul will walk us through a little of that. Um, also, we have a real interactive platform today. So we have, um, this is a, a Zoom meeting, you'll be able to uh, interact as we go along. Uh, the panelists will be presenting a wide array of, of topics today, ranging from um, ranging from the actual grow and, and uh, you know, what, what to think about when you're, when you're planning your grow this year, um, and then all the way through the end and what to think about in the extraction side and so forth. Um, so we encourage uh, participation. Please, uh, you know, make it as lively as we can. We will have a, a Q&A uh, section at the end where everyone can uh, kind of gather some other questions as well. So um, without further ado, I'm going to uh, kick off our webinar here. So, and I'm going to, let me just make sure, share my screen. All right. All right. Um, just get a, a thumbs up if uh, the panelists can see the screen okay. Excellent. Great. Well, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Paul Weibel. He's going to give us a uh, little background on the agenda and overview on Kifkir. Right on. Thanks, Jared. And uh, hey, uh, I also just wanted to echo your um, thoughts of uh, kind of welcoming everyone to come in these very rare times. Um, we hope you're all doing well um, and looking through the registration data. There's a lot of familiar faces, but also some, some new people. Uh, so we really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day and out of this, uh, again, kind of crazy environment we're in to learn about uh, Kif Cure and specifically um, our genetics business. So that's primarily the focus of, of today's webinar. But just to kind of tell you what we're going to tell you and walk you through the agenda, um, you know, as Jarrett mentioned, we thought it would be helpful for those of you that are new to Kif Cure to know a little bit about our business, our business model, and uh, frankly, how the genetics business fits into our overall kind of uh, sphere of expertise as, as well as, uh, as revenue objectives. Um, and then we'll turn it over to, uh, to Jared, who's gonna talk a little bit about what we learned in 2019 and what we're seeing in, in 2020 as uh, trends are quickly evolving in, uh, in this environment. And then Ryan, our director of genetics, uh, is gonna walk you through specifically not only the genetics and strains that we've uh, put together in our seed catalog, but also highlight um, some considerations uh, and uh, kind of echoing trends um, that should go into any farmer's strategy uh, as they're analyzing uh, their business plan and, and their approach to planning this year. So we'll touch on that. Um, and then we also think it's important to consider your exits as you're developing your plan. And uh, Mike, our director of extraction, will walk you through 2020 best practices Basically everything from, you know, the time you take that plant out of the field, what happens to it and ultimately how it's processed and ultimately monetized. So um, we're also going to, we'll turn it over to Steve at ProAmazing, um, who is a great example of a partner of ours that has some uh, proven yet relatively uh, new and super exciting um, growth solutions that he can uh, walk you through and give you some context in terms of, of where they fit in. Um, ultimately, as Jared said, we're hoping this is an interactive um, platform and, and uh, uh, hour that we're going to spend together. Um, so we're monitoring chat. So feel free to, uh, A, maybe drop us a line, let us know that you can hear everything okay. You can see the slides, everything's working okay. Um, and then feel free anytime we're going through uh, the content to, uh, to light in there with some 
some questions or feedback, we would really appreciate that. And ultimately, you know, at the end of this webinar, um, we'll all um, be following up with you guys um, and including our seed catalog, as well as an offer to uh, drill down one-on-one -on -one, um, in a consultation um, setting. Cool. Hey, thanks, Jennifer and Ashley. Appreciate it. Um, all right. So if you don't mind, uh, Jared, I'll quickly move through to um, the next slide. Um, and talk a little bit about KIF Cure again for the for the new people. Um, thanks for joining. We thought it'd be important for you to feel comfortable with kind of what we're good at and why genetics are important to us. And then, frankly, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what we're not good at. Um, and you know, to cut the chase there, we're not farmers, but we do everything in between. So a really good sound bite when you think about KIF Cure is a soil to oil company. So soil. You know, we're here today to focus on the seeds, seedlings, and clones that will, will go into the soil. We want to make sure that every single one of those is successful. Um, and we can add some value from a cultivation perspective. But again, we're not farmers. So Steve, for example, is, um, you know, a nutrient expert that would be uh, in our ecosphere. And, um, you know, from a total hemp solutions positioning perspective, a great example of if it's not a KIF care solution or product per se, we're likely to know someone that can help you get to where you need to be. So ultimately what we want to do is work with farmers that we, we feel will become friends and family and get to know your business, get to know your objective, get to know your soil type, your irrigation type, those types of things. And uh, if it's not a KIF care product or solution, hopefully as a total hemp solutions company, um, we'll know somebody that can get you where you need to be. Um, so that hopefully gives you a little context about um, kind of why we're moving into genetics aggressively this year. Um, but really at the end of the day, KIF Cure is an extraction company. KIF Cure is one of, if not the leading extraction company in the Midwest. We have labs in Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin. And as you might imagine, we want to work with super high quality feedstock that ultimately becomes really high quality oil that Mike and team will produce and ultimately will, will help sell. So genetics are really important for us um, that guarantee us really good feedstock um, that helps us make sure we continue to produce exquisite high quality oil. Um, so that's a little bit about KIF Care from a business model perspective, genetics, oil and then we'll also help you uh, sell it and that's um, our core revenue stream is producing um, crude distillate isolate the types of things um, that people are buying and, and product manufacturers are buying in bulk and then ultimately um, we'll sell that so um, we're also excited about um, strategic initiatives um, you'll see the bullet point there around the university studies so please stay tuned there are new um, announcements right on the cusp of us being able to share with you guys, but we're super, super excited um, to be working with some of the major leading universities, certainly here in the Midwest, that are advancing uh, the entire hemp industry. And we'll have more to talk about there. There may be, um, in some cases, um, really, really compelling benefits for partners or farmers to work with us um, in those studies, and we'll be rolling out um, details shortly. Um, but we're really proud of our, our association there. Not only will there be potentially some, some individual benefits for farmers, but also certainly collectively moving the industry forward um, with some super, super high quality, highly respected data. And you know, KIF Cure will play our small, small role in that. Those are being led by experts at the universities that I believe will be published, you know, um, widespread, fairly high profile studies that again should have super positive impact in the industry. And we're thrilled to be working in, uh, with with those initiatives and playing our, our small, small part there. So more to come there. Um, and then ultimately just to speak to the friends and family program bullet point there, I touched on it a little bit, but um, as we work with our farmers um, that we like to think of as friends and family partners, we'll get to know your business, your, your, your grow, your harvest, and we'll be able to plan from an extraction or a lab perspective um, when to um, anticipate that biomass. Um, so uh, in exchange for kind of working with us on the genetic front and giving us that insight um, into what to expect, and we know it's going to be good quality material coming out, we'll offer um, our genetics customers uh, friends and family pricing and priority uh, processing. So hopefully you can monetize those crops a little bit sooner by working with us and giving us visibility into that, into that pipeline. Um, 
So that I'll pause here for a second and see if there are any other questions or context we can offer there before we uh, before we move on to the next topic. I'm just looking at chat here. So if you have any uh, any thoughts or questions, feel free to to ping us. Um, yep, it looks like it's a good time to move on to uh, Jarrett's trend analysis here, and um, I'll turn it back over to Jarrett. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, let me get my video back up here. All right. Very good. So, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to go through here just a little bit about um, kind of what's ahead of us here in the uh, in the upcoming year and, and beyond. A lot, a lot of things are changing as as uh, as goes the world right now. Um, so, therefore, what we're uh, what we're doing here is kind of laying out just some of the things that uh, have been happening in the marketplace uh, from a CBD perspective, um, whether it's on the consumer retail product side or the overall, you know, I'll, I'll kind of go walk through this, uh, this progression here. So as you can see, there's, um, it's been, a, it's about a 700% increase in demand on the consumer side. So um, recent uh, article in, in Forbes magazine cited, uh, you know, 700% increase in demand, and they foresee that over the next five years. Um, many different reasons for that, a lot to do with regulations, a lot to do with uh, the 2018 Farm Bill, but um, we continue to see that on the uh, branded product side. Um, a lot of, uh, especially um, as, as more consumers seek out more, uh, what I'll call um, wellness products, uh, we feel that a lot of our products there fit into that and a lot of products in the marketplace are really making an impact on people's lives. Um, from a federal regulation standpoint, um, the FDA uh, over the last year has really been studying and taking public comments from uh, the industry and consumers and, and regulators and, and, also, and doctors and all sorts of different people and really taking into account um, because this is something new, something that um, they're, you know, really trying to craft their uh, their stance on on how they handle CBD moving forward. So look for more look for more uh, information to come from from uh, FDA uh, in the coming months and and years. Um, I'll touch next on the uh, cannabinoids we call minors. So um, many of you may have heard of of other uh, cannabinoids other than CBD or THC. Um, these are uh, you know what we the the CBG CBN. Um, CBC, these are other what we call cannabinoid minors that are really become, becoming prevalent in, um, in, uh, in adding additional benefit, wellness benefits to people. So you'll see a lot of those different uh, minors come into the marketplace here in the, in, uh, in the future. Um, next, I'll talk a little bit about uh, nano or water soluble. Um, <clears throat> so really, we've seen this come on strong over the last, um, let's say, 12 to 18 months, where um, you're really taking the isolated molecule of, of the CBD and, and turning it into a nano state where it can be absorbed into the body a lot, a lot more uh, efficiently. So um, many believe that nano and water soluble will dominate the market in years to come. So uh, keep an eye out for uh, nano or water soluble. So yeah, I just wanted to touch a little bit about the 2019 season. So um, last year was really our first chance at um, getting to provide genetics to some of our farmers. Uh, as you can see here, this is the, uh, the Boax strain that we, uh, we provided to a number of farmers throughout the Midwest. Um, turned out um, very successful, very wide ranging type of strain in terms of the uh, phenotype. Um, and really provide one thing that we found um, at the end of the season was that all of these, um, you know, the good genetics made some good biomass for us to uh, end up extracting, you know, good CBD counts, um, uh, some good minor counts, you know, CBCs and, and CBGs and so forth. So, um, you know, that's obviously one thing that, that, it, that, that we did last year was really provide a, a good genetic and it turned out to some good biomass. So yeah, just uh, touching a little bit of, uh, on the upcoming season here. So um, as Ryan will go through here in a little bit, we're, we've got a full lineup of top tier genetics from some of uh, uh, the, the top uh, breeders and, and cultivars around the country. Um, we've really uh, done our homework this year. Uh, Ryan and the team have done a great job of, of really understanding these genetics and understanding um, what they bring to the table from a uh, uh, whether it's a terpene uh, perspective, uh, CBD or minor perspective, 
perspective and really how it's going to perform in the uh, in the uh, overall um, Midwest, uh, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, which really we you know are are uh, focused on this year. Um, so yeah, pre-orders by April fifteenth. A lot of um, the the folks that we walk that we work with want us to get in some of our pre-orders uh, before the fifteenth. This is kind of a a cutoff, um, you know, for uh, whether it's uh, you know maybe some some pricing may have changed or, or availability and so forth. So we're really pushing um, here the next two weeks for us to kind of get through and and um, and get at least the the pre-orders. And the way the pre-orders work is we're uh, taking a thirty percent down. Um, if if the seed or the seedling or the clone is obviously available, then we can ship the full thing with uh, with a. a, a Full payment, but generally what we're doing is we're reser reserving those genetics for with a 30% uh, down payment and then uh, delivering them essentially whenever the uh, farmer will need to deploy the, the seeds or, or clones. So yeah, um, I, at this point, what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan Getzelman and um, he's going to go over a little bit about our genetic strategy. How are we doing? Hopefully everybody's having a good Wednesday so far. Um, so just want to start off by saying uh, we're in a very young industry, uh, especially with the genetics. Uh, CBD has really only been targeted uh, for the last 10 years, uh, especially on the genetic side of it. So a lot of those things in conjunction with a highly regulated and uh, underground market for a lot of the genetics for the past uh, 50 to 60 years has kind of uh, there's a lot of things that you need to be aware of because of that um, this coming year we, we have really focused on trying to make sure that we are getting the information for the farmers that's gonna provide a stable genetic lines that's going to come out THC uh, total T compliant, um, as well as be hardy in the Midwest. Um, that has entailed making sure that we are having the proper documentation, including COAs, terpene results, uh, various things like that, to back up a breeder's claims and uh, strains in genetics. Um, this year, we I've, have uh, vetted uh, through a couple of different sources and have come up with a good amount of strains that I'm very confident in, uh, mostly offering feminized seed this year. Um, the three main strains that I'm kind of uh, pushing this year, the things that I'll be going over in this next topic is kind of how I chose those and what I would suggest anybody kind of looks at it, any genetics they're thinking about growing. Um, so this year, just to touch on this slide, we plan on having seeds. Uh, we also plan on working on uh, setting up uh, some options to grow out seedlings until farmers are able to plant out, um, as well as setting up in for the future clones to have more uniform uh, stock to pull from. Um, as well as R&D continuing to just keep looking into more genetic lines um, and working to find out what the strengths and weaknesses of those are. Um, as well as we have a large Instagram following and online following that we are working with uh, to kind of track this whole process along the way and document it um, and work with the community on that aspect. Um, so some of the big things that I'm looking at when choosing strains, um, the intended use, what market am I trying to look for? Uh, is it going to be for smokable flour, uh, for extraction, uh, biomass or infusion? Um, what the terpene results are, what the flavor profile is of it, what the cannabinoid profile is on it. Um, another big thing to be aware of is the total T compliance. Um, so I believe it's October 20th, uh, nationwide, we will be moving to a total T compliance. And uh, I know Mike will be hitting on that part of it a little bit later, so I'll let him explain that. But that's important when you're selecting your genetics. Um, it's believed to 
be most dependent on your genetics for the cannabinoid profile or terpene profile. You're gonna have some variation due to climate and environment, um, due to phenotypic expressions and genotypes that are turned on based on different uh, pest pressures and natural things like that. But the genetics, the original core genetics is really gonna define what you're gonna get out of that strain. Um, looking into things like uh, how easily it's grown with minimal nutrients, um, what the regional weather effects, the cold, the frost, the wind, uh, how these are going to stand up to it, um, as well as the watering. Does the plot need to be irrigated? Is it going to do all right in a drought year? Um, as well as things like indoor, outdoor. Uh, I'm a believer that eventually uh, a lot of the gen, uh, growing for resin will be moved indoors. Um, but right now it's kind of choosing genetics for that outdoor that are going to be hardy to the weather environments, making sure that you're gonna make it through to that harvest. Um, so again, on that topic, uh, kind of just expanding upon it, uh, the vigor in the strain, the uh, variability in the strain. So how uniform is that seed stock that I got? Um, is there a lot of variation uh, from everything from structure to smells to cannabinoid profile? Uh, and then that kind of touches on the versatility of it. Uh, it. Am I gonna be able to use this as a smokable flower as well as an extraction strain? Is it have that high uh, resin to biomass uh, production. Um, so the type of soil again on the drainage and the types of you know soil that the plant does best in weather same thing uh, kind of just reiterating that and then I touched on it earlier the documentation making sure that you're getting the genetic tests the purity tests uh, for the seed stock make so just making sure that you have all that documentation that's really going to back up what you're asking for. Um, so the plant structure, uh, the, the plant structure is going to determine a lot of that. Uh, the indica kind of Christmas tree style is going to be a very hardy stock. Um, but from one of the farmers that I've talked with, he actually thinks that the sativa kind of lankier, bushier stands up to win better than that Christmas tree harder uh, one stock. So uh, the taller plants sometimes can do better in the wind than the shorter stockier plants. Um, the bud development on that same aspect, uh, is it producing a lot of resin to biomass? Is it producing just a lot of resin and not as much biomass? Um, and then the smoke appeal again on the flavors, terpenes. Um, and one thing to touch on there that I missed on the previous slide is terpenes are also important for the pest resistance of the strain. So uh, for instance, there's a terpene that the plant will put off that mimics a dying aphid. So that's going to be brought out in that plant if there's aphid pressure, it's gonna put out that terpene more to kind of put, resist aphid pressure. So the terpene result is also important for the general resilience and resistance of the strain as well as the taste and flavor profile. Um, again, areas of concerns, uh, making sure that you're not gonna have a really calcium hungry plant, uh, really, you know, something that's not gonna stand up well unless it's got silica added. You really want something that's going to be minimal inputs. You don't want to have to be babying the plant to make sure it's going to be thriving. You want that vigor with low inputs. Um, so the nutrient need total T compliant. Um, and for our genetics that we're offering this year, we have a uh, catalog that uh, we've put together that'll go through all of the specifics for the strains that we've chosen for this year. Um, sorry, just bringing up chat real quick, make sure I'm not missing anything on chat. Um, 
So I believe uh, Jason's going to put the link to this catalog in the chat for everybody to look over. Um, I'm not going to go over too much. Uh, I'm going to go over the three that I've kind of chosen and why I've chosen them as really our kind of featured strains for this year um, and how I came to that decision. So Apollo, Painted Lady, and Purple Emperor are the three that I'm suggesting for somebody um, on a couple of different notes. Uh, one is the time that you're going to be harvesting these. Um, if you notice, I'm going to bring up my notes here. Bear with me. Sorry, guys. Um, so each one of these strains is going to be able to be staggered in terms of your harvest. So it's in these notes, but I am not going to dig through it right now to find it. But one of them is a late September harvest, whereas the next one is going to be a early October harvest. And then the third one I chose because it's a late October harvest. Um, as, on top of that, that's going to allow you to stagger your harvest so you're not as pressured for drying space and also not as pressured for a ton of work all at once. Uh, if you notice also on the flavor of each of these, the terpenes in it, um, one of them has more of a peppery flavor, the other has a citrus flavor, and the third one has more of a floral flavor. So those are going to be a wide range. So then you have a good variety for uh, your harvest. And then also two of these have a good, all three of them have a very decent CBD range, but two of them also have a higher CBC and CBG content on it. That's enough to uh, kind of warrant it as more of a full spectrum, getting more out of that extract when you do go to that. Um, and all of these, we have a lot more information. Sorry, I'm kind of skimming over them right now. I don't have all of my notes right in front of me, so I don't want to say something that isn't entirely accurate. But our sales team can definitely sit down and tailor our strains that we've chosen to your specific needs, whether that's environmental and production, whatever that might be. So we, I'd really like to sit down and talk more on a one-on-one -on -one to tailor the strains to your farm and what your needs are. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Mike and I'm sure he'll expand on a couple of the topics that I had on as well. So Mike. Cool. How's it going everybody? Hope everybody can hear me. Ryan, want to give me a little thumbs up. Audio's coming in good. Yep. Perfect. You want to go back a slide there or. Yeah, I'm trying to. Sorry. There we go. There we go. Cool. Cool. So how's everybody doing this uh, afternoon? I really appreciate everybody coming in and kind of sitting down with us uh, on this pandemic hump day as ever. So I just wanted to kind of talk to you guys. I had the processing and extraction sector of Kip Cure. So basically my job, what comes into play after you harvest. So I'm going to go in a little more granular today on kind of uh, some of the, I've hit extraction really hard in the past couple of webinars. So I want to kind of hit some of the ancillary processes that happen prior to extraction that really a lot of people kind of lose putting focus on. It ends up being a pretty, uh, you know, can be a cumbersome process if not accounted for properly. So you want to go ahead and hit that next slide. Cool. So yeah, basically what happens after harvest is uh, for any extraction to occur for a plant material, most extraction solvents that you're going to use, you're going to need a dry plant material, um, not only for the extraction side, but also for it to be able to be storable without worrying about molding or any of those issues. So once it's uh, harvested, the crop must be dried. That way it can be stored properly prior to processing. And then prior to it being extracted, usually I like this to happen in pretty close uh, you know, proximity to when it's being extracted. That way you don't lose a lot of those terpenes and other uh, more volatile compounds you're trying to really hold in the plant. But it needs to be bucked and milled. Bucked meaning uh, the flour is removed from the stalk and then that flour is needing to be milled down to a uniform particle size, usually somewhere around that 
eighth inch to half inch mark. And what that does is it gives me a better opportunity to have an efficient extraction. So if you think about, uh, you know, trying to wash something that is in uni on uniform size and density, then really I'm not going to get an even wash of all the materials. Some of the material is going to soak up some of the solvent and some of the material is not really going to get access to it as much. I'm going to go ahead and hit that next slide. Cool. So there are some pitfalls of the conventional drying methods. One of the ones that's most common, or I would say is most common, is just the standard hang drying of the material. I put a picture here. This is of our Wisconsin facility up in Wild Rose. So after our harvest, we used a uh, sort of a nylon netting and ended up, uh, you know, streaming those nets down and hanging the whole plant upside down. Now, what this does is it takes a uh, you know, quite a bit of square footage to be able to pull this off, especially if you're doing anything over that, you know, that two to five acre mark. I mean, you're going to need some serious square footage. And Ryan alluded to this, which is really important. This is why staggering your harvest becomes so pivotal, because you really can get swamped for not only space to be able to accommodate for drying, but also labor to be able to accommodate for hanging and taking down of those plants, which, I mean, can be a bear to say the least. Um, one other thing too is when if you're trying to set up a warehouse or someplace to dry on your facility or on your site, make sure that it's as environmentally and humidically controlled as possible because uh, there's really, uh, that's the biggest issue you're going to run into is having to deal with the environmental factors happening around you. And especially after this year, a lot of the farmers can attest this was a wet, moist year and very hot as well, which is just a perfect breeding ground for a lot of those molds and mildews and mycotoxins just to kind of hang out and thrive in your crop. So one thing to always keep in account there, uh, humidifiers are great, fans are great, but you got to seal up that environment at a minimum if you want it to work. So you want to hit the next one there, Jarrett. Cool. So another option if you're trying to do, uh, if you're a larger grower or you're trying to do more throughput, a lot of these style dryers are the rotary or belt style continuous dryer. Um, what these basically do is that square box right down there, that's the main chamber that uh, the drying actually occurs in. And basically it's stages that are staggered with more heat and turbulence throughout the system as you go. This system in particular is a, a Triminator system, which is a domestic provider, I believe. Um, one thing I would always steer people towards, if you're going to go buying a mechanical dryer, um, usually these are very expensive. So don't, don't try to cut corners going uh, non-domestic and buying a Chinese dryer. I have uh, dozens of people this year tell me about how problematic those are. And then especially given the climate now, having access to any sort of uh, help there, or aid to maintenance that system is really kind of, uh, you know, non-existent to say the least. Sometimes one of these, these dryers too, if you're gonna be purchasing one of these style of dryers, make sure you ask them how high of heat and how much turbulence they're putting into the material. Because if you, you know, some of these I've seen are designed to get up to like 200 degrees, which can completely degradate all of your terpene content as well as a lot of your cannabinoid content, um, leaving you with kind of like almost a brown mulchy, it almost smells like hay, honestly, but on top of that, they're inducing a lot of turbulence to kind of help shake the plant dry. And that also will help uh, release a lot of glandular heads. So make sure if you're going to buy one of these dryers or one of these style dryers to accompany it with some sort of dust collection system, because that's really pivotal. And a lot of your good material can be just kind of, you know, pulverized throughout the system. You want to go ahead and go next. Yeah, so basically all of that does is uh, getting the material dry basically preps it so it can be extracted. Most solvents you're gonna use, like I said, are not gonna be able to be operated under a too high of a moist plant material that's working with. So once you get that nailed down and it's dried and you've found a processor, then you can start extracting. And then I'll get into some of these terms as well. So your first form of extract is a crude extract. And basically what that is, is any form of solvent you use, CO2, ethanol, hydrocarbon, whatever it may be, you have uh, rinsed the material with that solvent and then collected that solvent back. Now what's left is this uh, solution that has a lot of cannabinoids, but also sometimes a lot of fats and lipids and uh, gums and things that you don't necessarily want in there, which leads me into refined crude. Now refined crude is us prepping that crude material by filtering out some of the fats and lipids 
and also uh, heating it up and decarboxylating it or defuming the material so that whenever we're performing our distillation, our pressures aren't jumping all over the all over the place. So from that, that leads me into the two terminologies of most types of distillate that you find nowadays, and that is full and broad spectrum distillate. So uh, if I just take a distillation of a refined crude and don't do any sort of remediation to it, and I leave the THC content as well as all the other minor and major cannabinoids in it, that is a full spectrum distillate because I haven't I haven't mitigated any uh, components from the solution itself, so I've kept them all on board. Whereas a broad spectrum is, usually this is used for uh, manufacturers or people who are trying to deal with interstate commerce because they can't deal with the, the different THC rules, so they just wanna completely get out the THC or remediate the THC. And that's where you get a broad spectrum distillate or T3 distillate is another terminology for it. Um, an isolate is basically any sort of uh, major or minor cannabinoid that we've isolated into a crystalline, which usually those, since they've been isolated into a crystalline, don't have a whole lot of room for other foreign components to come along. So they're around like the 99 and the sometimes the 100% and even higher than that uh, as far as CBD or other uh, cannabinoid content goes. Uh, delve in a little more on nano, micro, and water soluble. Nano stands for a nano emulsified extract, which is something that's been broken down into that sub 80 nanometer uh, particle size. So that way it can be accessed by water as well as any membrane barrier that you might have. Um, and it's also emulsified with some sort of a excipient or carrier agent to help it kind of get through that uh, barrier as well. Microencapsulation is more of a, it's a different rendition of the same process in my eyes. It's basically just a breaking down the material and, and encapsulating it into something so that it can be accessed easier by your body. Cool, if you wanna go next to you, Jarrett. Awesome, so after our distillation, usually there's different refinement processes that you can go down into. And that's, a, like I had mentioned, the distillate, the isolate, the full spectrum, the water soluble, what have you. But the main thing that I want to make clear to a lot of farmers is to kind of, uh, you know, understand what your market and what your exit strategy is going to look like as soon as you possibly can. And a lot of that can kind of be leveraging us to kind of help find outlets for you or just utilizing what outlets you might have. But, you know, if you, if you have a bunch of crude extract that might not be able to sell for a higher, a high ticket value, but you're able to sell it, that's much, much better than taking a crude and refining it to the gills to where it's some nano water soluble extract that you don't really have a market for. So it's always something to keep in mind is kind of where is your exit and what's your quickest form to revenue versus how much do you want to make on your margins. It's always going to be a balancing match there. Um, if you want to go back there, here's a couple of videos of our distillation unit up in Wild Rose kind of kicking. And uh, what this shows is a full spectrum distillate coming out of the machine itself. So if you see there, good clear color, and that's kind of what you're looking for whenever you're doing a distillation like this. And then the video to the right is actually a sample we had prepped to send out. It just came out right from the vessel, so it's still nice and warm. Cool, next one. So one thing to keep in mind too, if you're gonna work with us on the genetic side is that you do get a little bit of a priority as far as uh, being able to utilize splits on your material. So we'll take, it'll do a 60-40 split on your material. Most of our other business on the extraction side will be handled on a fee tolling basis. So um, save you a little bit of upfront expenditure. If you end up going with us on the genetic side, we'll not only put you kind of on the front of the line, so to speak, for when you get extracted, but we'll also allow you to take a, a, a very uh, favorable split. So here's another longer video of our distillation system kind of kicking up there and that shows our crude material to start with. Sorry, I like to play around with our little feed tank. So here's the residue stream. That's basically stuff that needs to get re-evaporated and there's your full spectrum distillate. Let me give you guys some transparency on you know, some of our equipment and what we look as a good product there. Cool, so that's gonna do it for my side. I appreciate you guys bearing with me and uh, please reach out. I think my contact info will be jetted out to you guys if you wanna speak about anything else or dig deeper, let me know. Thanks. Great, thank you, Mike, appreciate it. Uh, 
Yeah, so um, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually um, just see if we got, uh, I'm gonna um, turn it over to uh, Steve Harkley from uh, ProMazing Products. So uh, Steve and Bob and the, and the, and the crew over at uh, ProMazing, they're a, they're a key partner of ours. I've been working with them for a, a few years now, um, helping um, get some of their organic products into the uh, hemp market, hemp and cannabis markets. So. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, turn it over to Steve right now. Steve, uh, can you, let's see here. Um, can you hear us? Uh, can you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. So, yeah, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving a little a background of the benefits that you provide to a lot of uh, uh, hemp farmers, that, that would be tremendous. Yep. So, uh, my name is uh, Steve R. Kelly. Uh, our company uh, is ProMazing, Inc. Uh, it's one of our uh, companies under uh, our umbrella. Another company we have is uh, Global Soil Solutions. Uh, Global Soil Solutions is, is kind of the uh, manufacturer of the ProMazing products. Uh, so we've been uh, working with Jared, like he said, for a, a few years now. Uh, we had growers uh, from Wisconsin, Michigan. Uh, we had growers in Colorado, uh, Kansas, uh, and Oklahoma last year. Uh, we came into it, uh, into uh, the hemp program uh, or at an early stage for most of the growers. A couple of the growers we uh, got in a little bit later. Uh, our SOP is we like to come in uh, a couple months, uh, two to three months before planting. Uh, we come in, we do a comprehensive uh, soil analysis. Uh, part of that soil analysis that we do, a key part of it is our uh, microbial testing. Uh, and we're finding out uh, as we get into our uh, third year of hemp growing now uh, that the microbials are, are really the, the workhorses uh, for the whole program. Uh, they take and have the ability to uh, not only remediate uh, soil that has been, you know, abused or even soil that, uh, as we saw up in Michigan, uh, we were working on hay fields that uh, had been nothing but hay for 20 years. Uh, you know, but part of that uh, was that, you know, that they did use uh, not necessarily some pesticides, but some, uh, you know, some older uh, nutrients that, uh, you know, were not of the organic nature. Uh, and that being said, of course, there was no tilling going on. So there was a lot of compaction uh, on the soil. Uh, they got us in there, not necessarily when we wanted to, uh, but we were able to do some heavy applications of the microbials that got the soil uh, dialed in and, and the timeline that they gave us, which wasn't very much, it was about 30 days. Uh, so once we once we had the uh, the soil analysis, basically what we do is is we come up with a prescription for your land, uh, you know, for the genetics that you have for your region, um, you know, and it, and we can dial that in uh, in different ways. Uh, we like to work with the growers and we'll develop a feeding schedule, uh, so we'll get ahead uh, ahead of you uh, on the microbial end. And we'll make our applications and then we'll work with you right at planting. Uh, so if we have the opportunity to do some inoculation of the plants, uh, which is basically an application to the root ball as they're being planted, uh, a couple of the growers, not many, a couple of growers went with seed. Um, the microbials will actually help with the germination of that as well. Uh, what we did find and, and we're quantifying this year with some lab testing uh, that none of none of our crops uh, went hot, and I and I say our crops, you know, the growers, but uh, none of those went hot. And and we heard uh, some communication, and we were actually on some calls with some growers and even with some other vendors, uh, and and they said that they had uh, quantification and, uh, of that, uh, and we're working on getting that uh, on ours as well. Uh, we do know that from our due diligence with the industry standards that. I, I feel that we have the, the best formulation, and it's a broad spectrum formulation of the microbial strains. Uh, we list, you know, more than 12. Uh, our uh, formulation actually includes more than 30, uh, but they're proprietary, so we don't list them, we don't mention them, but uh, they're very comprehensive in their scope. Uh, we've been working with this microbials formulation for more than 20 years. Um, as with a lot of them, it, you know, it started in uh, remediation for sewage treatment and grease traps and things, and then kind of evolved into the farming end of it. Um, on the nutrient side, uh, we work with uh, several different companies uh, on the nutrients. We blend 
uh, again, per this prescription uh, for your land, for your crop, for your region, uh, what those needs are. And as you'll see, or as you may know now, uh, if you're in your second or third year of hemp growing, the nutrients will change as the cycle of the plant changes. So as your uh, plants you know, develop and come into the veg stage, we have one uh, recommendation or prescription for the nutrients. Uh, and then as they uh, come out of the veg stage and, and go into pre-flower, uh, you know, the nutrients will change at that point. So we'll work with you on that. Uh, we usually have boots on the ground that'll do some of the testing. Some of the more remote locations, uh, like we experienced up in Wisconsin, uh, we had the growers sending in uh, the soil or tissue tests uh, after, after uh, weeks would go by. Uh, our normal SOP for the soil testing is uh, pre-planning. Uh, then every two weeks after that during veg, uh, once we get into flower, uh, we're doing a testing uh, about every two weeks uh, at that point, uh, up until uh, about a week before harvest. Um, what we did uh, recommend last year is after harvest, uh, depending on if they uh, did any cut down or if they did any mowing uh, of, of any of the fiber that was not being used, uh, or if they, even if they did some cultivation, uh, we did go in with a, a last application of the microbials uh, with a combination of the humic acid. Uh, the humic acid is a great carbon source in itself for the soil, but it's also a food source for the microbes. So they, they will continue to work. Uh, there's really no place in the U.S. that gets cold enough um, that will kill them off. Uh, and it, what they do is they help build a, a very diverse uh, biocommunity in the soil. So going into what we're seeing now, you know, the 2020 growth season, we're going to need to put down less nutrients we're going to need less inputs for the hemp um, because what they're doing is they're actually drilling down into the lower stratas of the soil and releasing the nutrients that were not accessible by plants before um, i'm assuming that a lot of the growers are going to be going with either seedlings or seed grown uh, so that that tap tap root of the hemp plant when it drills down uh, it's going to be able to access some of those nutrients and the microbes are going to help the plant be able to take up those nutrients so it's, it's, it's really, a, you know, a, a kind of a start to finish and even after, after harvest, uh, the benefits of what we can provide for the growers uh, is pretty, pretty broad. Um, what we also saw is that it increased the amount of CBD oil because of the extra nutrients or the, you know, the nutrients that we provided uh, for the plants. So, uh, you know, like they were, like we were seen or like we heard, uh, you know, in the other presentations, uh, the, you know, the oil is, is really what everybody's going for. So if we can help the plants, uh, we can help uh, maximize the amount of CBD oil that the plant provides. And then on the backside, if we can help start to rebalance that soil and condition it for the next grow season, uh, I really think it's the best of both worlds. And uh, what we've seen with other companies, uh, you know, competitive companies that we've gone up against, uh, that seems to be putting us ahead of the pack. Um, because we're we're working, we're growers too. So you know we're working with the growers to try to reduce their inputs from year to year, while keeping the soil as balanced uh, as possible. And if we get into the situation like we uh, started to last year in some of the farms, uh, some of the farms had some really high glyphosate readings, uh, or they had some heavy metal uh, readings early in the season. We have the op opportunity to be able to go in and uh, basically remediate that soil. Uh, depending on how bad it is, uh, we'll need more time, uh, but usually two to three months uh, is, is a pretty good uh, head start for us to go in and get that, at least that top 10 inches uh, remediated and, and ready for planting uh, for the hemp. So I hope, I hope that helps to explain a little bit. Uh, I'm sure uh, Jared uh, will share our email or my email and contact info. So if anybody has any uh, direct questions or would like to do a call, we're always available to help. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, that was that was very beneficial. And um, yeah, I'd like to open it up if, if there are any questions. Um, maybe give it a give it a few minutes here. We'll um, uh, see if there are any questions for Steve or for any of other panelists. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, and, and everyone's time today who, who attended. Um, uh, we're going to be hosting these uh, once uh, once a week, it sounds like. So uh, given the uh, 
the <laughs> homebound nature of everyone. We're gonna be doing some every Wednesday at three o'clock. So that's pretty, a, a pretty much a standing meeting uh, as, as of right now. Um, so let's see if we have any, doesn't look like we have any questions yet. Even I really appreciate your presenting too. And I like that you guys have a little bit of a eye on sustainability above all. And I have seen the products as well, guys. He's not just talking, they do work. Thanks, Marco. Yeah, no problem at all. One thing I did want to address though to you guys too is um, we had mentioned total THC compliance versus uh, Delta 9 compliance. Or we kind of hit on it a little bit. I guess I wanted to get a little more granular with everybody. So everybody's on the same page. So come October 20th of this year, 2020, there's going to be a change and a shift from all the states that opted into the Delta 9 THC compliance will effectively have to shift towards the national standard of a total THC compliance. Now, a couple of problematic things there. Um, the date first, um, whoever set that up, that was kind of a uh, foolish of them to set up a date for the total THC shift to happen right as people are harvesting. So the A, I think that's that's an issue to kind of be aware of. And then B, if you're going to be the guy to kind of risk it and go for the Delta 9 THC compliance in lieu of getting a more robust CBD rich plant, um, do understand you can really shoot yourself in the foot and limit yourself to A, interstate commerce or B, not being in that nationally a legal standard, which can really limit you on your outlets on the back end. So one thing I kind of wanted to make sure that everybody was fully aware of. And uh, another thing too, whenever they are measuring total THC, the formula is uh, it's THCA times 0.877 plus the Delta nine THC. And I will actually put that in the notes for everybody to look at too. So they have a copy of that, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody's kind of aware of that. Cause it's something that is very pivotal for this year in particular. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Mike. Yeah, that's great context. I thought that um, lettered up well with a question we just got from Gage. Gage, thanks for your question about uh, genetics for smokable flour. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, our goal in putting together the seed catalog um, that we're sharing with you today is to give um, growers options depending on their business models. So or business objectives, as I might sometimes say. So if you're growing for a smokable flower market, we absolutely have very terpene rich, awesome, really, really killer uh, genetics that also, um, uh, per Mike's guidance, will be total T compliant. Um, so they're interstate uh, commerce enabled, if you will. Um, if for some reason um, you have an exit that will allow you to keep your flower in state, then you, know, you may want to go a different direction. So we've got you covered both from a total T compliance perspective, as well as a, a kind of in, intrastate um, exit strategy that might be a little higher in CBD. So we have you covered there. The other thing that um, I wanted to point out as it relates to the three strains that Ryan touched on is those are very terp, those are examples of very, very terpene rich, you know, three to 5% in some cases of terpenes, which is roughly twice what um, many strains are in the marketplace today that lend themselves towards really killer smokable flour, as well as being total T compliant. So hopefully that answers your question. Ultimately, um, you know, our uh, development process in terms of developing new relationships uh, is very similar to uh, uh, Steve's uh, tact, which is um, a consultative approach is what I would call. So let us know what, what you're trying to accomplish. And, uh, you know, we're happy to, to kind of give you our best thinking, whether it's a regulatory um, concern, genetics concern, irrigation concern, you're concerned about mold or soil type. Uh, we have hopefully a lot of experience to bring to bear that'll get you where you need to be. So again, that's kind of our call to action is, is let us know um, if there are questions. Now, if you do know what you want, um, as Jarrett mentioned, these seeds are available today. You can reserve the genetics with 30% down. In some cases, they're available immediately. Otherwise, um, we'll deliver them when you need them and you know, final payment is due upon delivery. So. Um, that's the quick scoop. We're, we're open for business and happy to help. And if you know what you need, um, we're also happy to fulfill that for you right now. One thing to keep in mind too, Gage, is that a lot of our strains in particular, our three featured strains this year, are also they're total THC compliant, even when trimmed. Our genetics specialists even went through and trimmed the flower and then did a 50 pound batch test to make sure that even as a trimmed flower, it's still compliant, still rich in terpenes and still a viable product. So that's something that's really important to hit on. And I wanted to kind of 
point everybody's attention over to the chat bar here. Philip Alberti made a great point. He said, in Illinois, after the October 2020 deadline, the goal will be to make products grown in 2019 and 2020 marked as an intermediate product. And it will be okay for extraction, but not smokable flour. And he is, uh, he is from the U of I's extension. Uh, very, very good info there to have, Phil. I think you're absolutely right. And one thing to keep in mind too, is even if it is a hot, considered a hot product, if you're selling it to a processor in the state that you grew it in, you do have leniency there to still get your product processed. But obviously there may need to be some THC remediation or something downstream to make it still viable for interstate commerce. But I just yeah, wanted to thanks, shine some light on that. Yeah, I appreciate that, Phil. Um, thanks, Mike, for that, that clarification as well. And um, yeah. I just wanted to, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Jared, just to answer Gage's uh, question. Yes, we do have photos of the flowers in each, uh, for each strain, um, and that's in the seed catalog that we'll be following up with you on. So thanks for the question. Excellent. Yeah, um, Ashley just asked if we could share that info from uh, Phil to all of the uh, attendees. I am actually putting that in there right now. So give a couple minutes for everybody to uh, check that out. But yeah, open for Q and A's. Feedback, questions, we appreciate it all. Yep. Oh, this is uh, Steve. I just uh, wanted to mention that you, you brought up a, a good point that I kind of skipped over uh, that about the consultative end of it. And, and that's really what, what, this, what this is uh, on our end. Uh, I, I often mention it or, or refer to it as, as a partnership, but in essence, you know, we, we are consultants that are available, you know, uh, seven days a week because, the, you know, once we get these plants in the ground, we can't really take an intermission. So uh, what we saw last year uh, was very, very uh, pleased to see the pictures coming in, both good and bad. Uh, I'll give you an example of a, a grower that we tried to get early with uh, in Kansas, Kansas City, Kansas, and he was a corn farmer the year before. And I asked him and, and begged him, uh, you know, to get us some soil samples so that I could, you know, analyze it and see where we were. Well, the, the problem that he had the year before that he didn't mention was that he had corn borer beetles. Uh, had we known that, we would have gone in and done a, uh, you know, a, a kind of a sterilization on his soil. Uh, he did not tell us that. So he, uh, the, the corn borer beetles, as you can imagine, presented themselves to that nice sweet taste in hemp uh, pretty late in the grow. Uh, and then he had a windstorm that came in and actually had stalks that were snapping. And once they were snapping, you know, of course, it revealed that the corn borer beetles had eaten the cellulose inside the plant. So, uh, again, this consultation, you know, it, it may seem a little uh, premature on the front side, but we're, we're trying to prevent situations like that uh, where we have repetitive pests or, uh, you know, pests that uh, might have appeared in one crop. Um, that the grower might not think that they were going to come in and, and you know, uh, attack the hemp, uh, which these uh, insects absolutely did. So just, just uh, uh, again, uh, you know, it is a consultative thing, and we are there to help right on through, you know, uh, through harvest and uh, even after that, because we'd like to go in uh, one, one last time and just kind of build a database that we present to the growers at the end of the year. Here's where we started with the soil health. Here's where we ended, and you'll see a definite incline uh, going into the next year's grow. Uh, down here in Florida, we're looking at uh, probably at least two grows, uh, one in the, in the late spring, uh, which, you know, we would be getting ready to do if it wasn't for the virus, and uh, one in the fall. So that, that scale, you know, that database that we're going to be able to build on the soil health is going to be very relevant to these growers uh, and very quanti quantifying for them to be able to see it firsthand. Oh, that's huge. I think it's a big point to make is that we aren't just trying to sell a product here. We're trying to really develop and, and nurture relationships for longevity. And then we're not going to be able to do that by just giving you something that doesn't work and then not assisting you anymore after that. So very good point to make there, Steve. And that's kind of why we like to partner with people such as yourself. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you, Steve, again, for all your insights and the panel. I think this uh, uh, was a, a good uh, interaction as well from the from uh, from you all out there, so we pr really appreciate that again. And um, yeah, look at that! It looks like we got it in uh, right in the hour. Uh, so um, yeah, take care, be well, everyone. And again, thank you.
I'll see you soon. Everyone. Thanks all. Be safe. Thanks, everybody. Take care, Michael.